Okay. How many of you are depending on the first one? How many of you are depending on the second one? Wow, oh, so many more people depending on the second one. I thought the first one was easier. Maybe I did something wrong. We did. Okay. Um, so let's. Let's get right to it. Did anybody do the pre lecture reading? Yes. No. yes. Good. Why do you have a random S in there? Yes. Random what? You yeah. had a random S. Yes. He forgot the I. He forgot the I in front of the S. I'm not that self centered. I don't always think about I. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I typed that up very quickly this morning, so I don't know. Okay. Um, so I want to start uh, with the case that we're familiar with, of course, the ABC theory. And I want to sort of give you some idea. of where Okay, so the ABC theory was based on the Lagrangian that was written like this, okay, there's a, basically there's a version of the kinetic term for each field, phi A, phi B, phi C, so I just wrote it as a sum over all three. And then this is the single interaction term, which we can identify as a product of the three fields, phi A, phi B, and phi C. Now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna take this Lagrangian and I'm gonna, basically gonna show you where the essential bits of the Feynman rules came from can't derive it because that's unfortunately what you spend the bulk of the time in a quantum field theory course doing, but I'm at least going to show it to you so that when we look at the other theories, which again, we've already got the Lagrangians for, we spent a lot of time developing the Lagrangians for QED, uh, for the strong interactions, the electroweak interactions. Um, once we kind of know what you do with the Lagrangian, then we're going to be able to take those Lagrangians and extract from them the analogous rules for these other theories, which are going to be quite a bit more complicated. So uh, recall that based on this Lagrangian, we built all of our Feynman diagrams out of three quantities, or out of three bits. First of all, we had particles A, B, C, so they could exist and propagate, and they were often represented by lines, and they could both be external, so the, the incoming or the outgoing states, or they could be internal and they they were therefore virtual, but nonetheless, they were represented by lines. And then, of course, we had an interaction vertex, which we represented as such, and that is uh, evidenced by this product of the three fields. And so basically, we took these ingredients and we used them as building blocks to form any Feynman diagram that we might need to describe a process. Really, actually, you're just taking combinations of this, because this, of course, includes these external lines. Okay. All right, now, the, uh, this is useful for sort of constructing our diagrams, but then once we've constructed the diagrams, there were a couple of rules that we had to follow for writing things down. Whenever we had an internal line, so for internal lines, we wrote down a propagator factor, which was I over the momentum squared minus m squared c squared for the particle in question. So again, if it was a, I'll just call it j, where j could have been a, b, or c. So when we were writing down the expression for m, which we would eventually put into the golden rule to calculate a, a decay rate or a scattering amplitude, uh, for any internal line in a diagram, we would write down a propagator factor like that. And then for any vertex in our diagram, we would write down a factor of minus ig, okay? So let's actually see if we can sort out how these might arise from a Lagrangian. Again, I can't derive this rigorously, but at least once we kind of get the result, we can apply it. 
uh, to other cases. So first of all, for vertex factors, that is, what do you put when you write or when you have a vertex in your diagram. For the vertex factors, what we do is we write out the following expression. We write I times the interaction part of the Lagrangian. Okay. So for our ABC theory, if I do that, I would have uh, uh, minus I G phi A phi B phi C. Okay. The interaction part of the Lagrangian is where we're multiplying fields together. That's where these vertex parts of the diagram come from. So we just multiply that times i, and then, in Griffith's language is, I think, hilariously dated, we rub out a uh, field variables, or we erase the field variables. Okay, I'm not even gonna write that. <laughs> so the fields are the phi A, phi B, phi C. Okay, so I just eliminate them and I'm left with the vertex factor, which again is what we have over here. Okay, that is, that, as satisfying as that is, that is not a derivation that this is what you should do. It is simply the, the way that you can get the result. Yes? Is that kind of more generalized that if you talk yeah. about other interactions and we had, say, a uh, different interaction of minus k a uh, phi a phi a phi b we would get a factor of negative i k for every vertex of that interaction yeah 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 so and we're going to apply these rules to qed in just a few minutes that's why i'm writing them down is so that we can then apply them to a, a less trivial thing okay so we again we write i times the interaction term and then we just erase the fields. Now there will be a little bit of a caveat to that when you're dealing with gauge fields because they carry a certain uh, uh, dimensionful coefficient that we also have to erase and that's just a headache that we have to deal with. But fortunately it's the same headache for all gauge fields so it won't be a big deal. Um, more interesting perhaps though is the propagator factors. So the propagator factors we get from the Lagrangian, but we actually get them from the Lagrangian by way of the equations of motion. Okay, so remember the equations of motion you derive from the Lagrangian so that they're in fact connected. And the propagator factors are really describing just the sort of momentary free propagation of a virtual particle. Because if I had a diagram like this, I've already accounted for the vertices in the vertex factors. So what I'm really interested in describing is the propagation of the virtual particle from one vertex to the other. But once it's done interacting at the vertices and before it's interacted at this vertex, it's propagating freely. So what we should actually focus on is the free part of the Lagrangian. But moreover, the equation of motion corresponding to the free part of the Lagrangian. Now Claudia is going to be happy to remind us what equation of motion should we expect to be associated with this particular free Lagrangian? What's the name of it? It's one of three. You got three options. It's either the Klein-Gordon, the Dirac, or the Proca. Klein-Gordon. Yes, good. Sounded a little bit like you were guessing, but I'm going to take that as modesty. You didn't want to show off. That's good. It's good. Um, so we're going to have the, the Klein-Gordon equation as the relevant equation of motion. So to uh, construct the propagator factors, this is what we do. Uh, we start with the equation, the relevant equation of motion. If I can find that, here we go. And again, these are going to look slightly different than what we've worked with in the past because of all of the changes in convention. It's usually just going to amount to a minus sign here or there, a factor of i. Uh, there will be one place I'll mention a little bit later where there's going to be a, a pretty substantial revision, but I'll give you what that revision is. So that's the Klein-Gordon equation for a field phi. And then what we do is we write it in momentum space. So we're going to take, uh, sorry, not a minus sign. I don't think it would matter, but we're going to take uh, I h bar d mu and send it to p mu. And bearing in mind that this thing is equal to zero, 
I can rewrite this equation as now p squared minus mc squared at minimum phi equals zero. There's an overall factor of uh, one over h bar squared that I went ahead and got rid of. Okay. Notice the relative minus sign that gets introduced when you square the i in the d mu d mu. And now, to, to extract the propagator, what we do is we take the inverse of the operator in brackets and we multiply it by i. And that is the form of our propagator. And lo and behold, in the ABC theory, that's exactly what we wrote. Are we also yeah. rubbing out the field again? Say again? We're rubbing out the field again as well. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. Well, that's why I say you're taking the inverse of the thing in okay. brackets. But yeah, you're rubbing out the field. I'm going to rub it out. My field. That's fine. But you only have to rub one out here. Alright, now I'm going to do it. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, so um, so are there any questions about the procedure? Again, this is not well motivated because to derive that you should be doing this requires much more machinery than we have in our back pockets, Mark. So the fact that we have to take the inverse of the p squared minus mc on squared, that is in one field theory or something? Yes. Okay. It just seems kind of random. <laughs> if you've ever constructed propagators, I don't know if you actually construct propagators in any of your other classes. I think so. No? Green's functions? Ish. Maybe like ish. Or something. If you've ever seen Green's yeah. functions, that's very, very intimately connected with constructing propagators. Um, so this is all dealing with a scalar field. So this is all with a scalar field, and we're about to apply it to spinner fields. And yes, it's going to be more complicated. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the rest of the Feynman rules, the rest of the Feynman rules are largely just doing the things that make sense, right? Remember we, we throw in those factors that conserve four momentum at each vertex. We integrate over all of the internal four momenta. Right, does anybody else remember what, what other things we do? This is the Feynman rules for constructing M. You get rid of the yeah, after so at the end of at the end of writing everything down, you do as many integrals as you can until you get an overall factor of the momentum or the, the delta function on the momentum of the incoming and the outgoing particles, and then you just rub that out and multiply by i. So lots of rubbing out going on today. Uh, sorry, uh, did I yeah, there's a minus there. That's the inverse. Okay. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take this, uh, this story and see if we can now apply it to the Lagrangian for quantum electrodynamics. Yeah. All right, so lo and behold, for... QED, we have the following Lagrangian, and again, and I think even last time when I gave you the new conventions, or, th or what expressions look like in the, in the new conventions, I left out the I in front of this term. I, at least I left it out in my notes. So if you're comparing the earlier versions of this, I left out the I. This is what it should be. Okay, so we know that quantum electrodynamics is a real theory. Okay, this actually pertains to the real world, and it describes the electromagnetic interaction of matter. But of course, if we're dealing with matter, then Marcus is going to be happy to remind us what kind of fields we have to deal with. So, so matter, we have to deal with um, spinners. Spinners, good. So that means that we're going to be dealing with whose equation, Kellen? Dirac. Good, the Dirac equation. And we already see the beginnings of the Dirac Lagrangian. I know, good, you need a high five for that. Okay. Our matter particles can have mass, so that is the associated mass term for the matter particles. They interact, and remember, we've spent a lot of time developing this story. The form of the interaction, which we can recognize as 
two of the matter fields multiplied by the gauge field A, so this is in fact an interaction, the form of this is dictated by demanding local invariance under U1 transformations. It's just, you can't just arbitrarily throw in an interaction to get the right description of QED. You get this specific term from a symmetry argument, okay? And similar for the other interactions. And then lastly, to finish off the Lagrangian, we have to let this guy propagate. And so we give him his own kinetic term, which I will write out explicitly as such. That's F mu nu, F mu nu, in more compact notation. Okay? So that is now the Lagrangian for QED. And what we want to do now is essentially try to follow these steps but for the case of QED, okay? Now some of this is straightforward, at least one of these is rather subtle and I'll just give you the result because it's rather hard to follow through the argument. Um, but let's see if we can get what the interactions look like. So first of all, the interaction term is sitting here. Okay, so I can go ahead and construct that. But before we actually construct the quantity that we write down, let's talk about what this interaction would look like as a vertex. So we know that it's going to have a matter field, a matter field, and a gauge field. For QED, we represent the gauge fields, their photons, sorry, by these wavy lines. Not So we've got three kinds of lines that we draw for gauge fields. We've got the wavy lines for photons. Eventually, we'll do jagged lines for the weak bosons, and then we do these springy lines for gluons. Okay, so, so don't, don't, don't think that this is this right now. It's actually just a wavy line, you know, because it's a wave. It's wavy. Uh, okay, so we draw a wavy line. That represents the photon part of the vertex. And then the matter coming in and out, now that we're dealing with the Dirac equation, we have a charge associated with these things. That lets us distinguish particles from antiparticles. But of course, antiparticles are part of the Dirac story. And so what we do in this case is we add to the matter lines arrows indicating the flow of charge, or you can think of it as whether or not this is a particle or an antiparticle, interpreting this as the flow of time. Okay? So in this case, this would be an electron coming in and an electron going out. And there would just be some vertex corresponding to the emission of a photon. But you might say, well, psi bar, isn't that kind of like a positron? Like, what's going on there? Well, one way to think about this vertex is in terms of everything coming in to the vertex. So everything coming into the vertex. And in that case, I have to interpret this guy as going against its flow. All right, so that's where we see the psi bar factor. But don't worry about that. It's, it's just a matter of interpretation. All you need to know is the following. When you draw diagrams like this, these arrows are actually helping us remember to conserve charge. For example, if I tried to draw something like this, actually, let me, let, me, let me do this. This might make more sense, be a little less ambiguous. So we can always rotate these diagrams. If I accidentally drew something like this, this would represent two electrons going forward in time, combining, and a photon coming out. What's the problem with drawing that? Yeah, these both carry negative fundamental charge, so they would combine to give you something with negative two times the fundamental charge, but the photon doesn't have a charge. But that is corrected by maintaining the flow. What goes in goes out, so now this is a negative charge, a positive charge, combining, canceling their net charge to zero to give me the photon charge, zero. Yes, Jacob. So when an arrow goes against time, is that always an antiparticle? Yes. 
So that's the nice thing about these diagrams is that as you rotate them, you're actually switching particles into antiparticles. And so when you build diagrams, depending on what elements you need, sometimes you're going to need particles, sometimes you're going to need antiparticles. What if it's uh, instant in time then? If it's straight up? So if it's so you don't you don't need to interpret it as much as just conserve the flow. That's the important thing. So the only time you're going to have vertical is in internal lines. Right? So, you, well, you still need to put an arrow on it, but think of the arrow not as, oh, I need a positron going vertical or an electric. You know, just say, I need the flow to go into the vertex because somewhere else I've got a flow going out. Okay? So this flow is really just us, through the diagrammatic elements, preserving electric charge. That's one way to think about it. Okay? So this is the fundamental vertex of QED. This is what you have to build everything from. You don't get any other options in QED. Except the fact that QED technically applies to any charged particle. So this doesn't have to be an electron. It could be a muon because a muon carries electric charge. It could be a tau on, it could be quarks, it doesn't matter. Okay? Well, for right now, I'll just write it in terms of an electron, okay? But you could switch out any other charged particle. It has to be the same charged particle going in as charged particle coming out. You can't have an electron turn into a muon through the electromagnetic interaction. Okay? So now, to get the vertex factor, so remember, we draw diagrams, and then for every vertex, we have to write something down. So we're on our way to constructing what we have to write down. We multiply the interaction Lagrangian term times I. Here you go. And then we erase the field variables, psi bar and psi. Okay. But unfortunately, when we go to erase the gauge field, we have to take care of some funny business associated with the units of gauge fields. And so the factor that we actually erase is actually the square root of h bar c over 4 pi times a mu. Now, it's just a constant. It's just taking care of units. It's not doing anything significant to the result. Okay, It's kind of like if I had a 3 in there and I erased it. The important thing is what's left over. And what's left over is, of course, minus i q gamma mu times the root 4 pi over h bar c, where what is crucial to notice is that this is not a number. It's got a gamma mu in it. In fact, Patrick will be happy to tell us what kind of object this is. Good old gamma mu, remember that guy? You want to phone a friend? Anybody want to help him out? It's, 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 it is. Say again? Is it a generator? We use it to build the generators. Is it a spinner? It is not a spinner. It's, somebody said vector, which you, you, you think it's got a vector index. In what space? In spin space. So these are the gamma matrices, the Dirac gamma matrices, and they carry a vector space time index, but secretly they're hiding two spin indices that we never write. They are matrices in spin space and vectors in space time. Okay? So you can already see, oh shit, QED is going to make us deal with these complicated things. So that's why we spend so much time <laughs> developing them and getting used to them. Okay? Uh, the square root here just cancels the factor that I pulled out when I pulled out uh, the a mu. And then we actually, for simplicity, because particle physicists are lazy, we define this vertex factor. If I can find it on my sheet, where is it? Oh, we define this to be I times the electromagnetic coupling G times gamma mu. Okay, so we just soak a minus q square root of 4 pi over h bar c into the definition of GE, and we'll do everything in terms of GE. Yeah. You said that the two charged particles in the vertex have to be the same? Yeah. What in the Lagrangian tells you that? Because it's 
psi and psi bar, it's the same field. Yeah, so when we when we write down this Lagrangian with multiple matter fields, we copy this. So we would have a psi for the electron, and this would be the psi bar for the electron. And then we do the same thing for the muon and the tau on and all the quarks and yeah, so it's it's in the Lagrangian, it's just I, I've only written it for one particle species, so Okay. Now for the so this is our vertex factor, the analog of minus i g in the ABC theory. This is our vertex factor for QED. We do this. We use it in exactly the same way. We we'll draw a diagram, and we want to compute m from that diagram. Every time we see a vertex factor, we write a factor of i g gamma mu. Okay. Now you can already sense that there's going to be a headache associated with that. Can anybody guess what that headache is going to be? So there's that. You've got to get a number at the end of the day. M has to be a number. So remember when we were doing ABC diagrams and we, you know, we were futzing around with stuff like this and we had one, two, three vertices, so we just did this. Yeah. And didn't think about it. Yeah. We didn't think about where we put things because you can always move things around. Not so, my friends. Not so the case in QED. Everything has got to go in a very specific place. So this will be what you write down for each vertex, but it's got to be appropriately placed in the expression. Order matters. These things are matrices in spin space. Okay. So we'll. See. We'll see how to do that in a minute. I'll give you a rule for constructing that in a minute. It's just I, I want you to see it's already going to be more complicated than the ABC theory, but it's going to be complicated in more ways than this. <laughs> so uh, now we have propagators. So for the propagators, we have two propagators that are possible in a diagram. We have Propagators for internal electrons or positrons, okay? If we have uh, electrons and positrons, they of course satisfy the Dirac equation, so the relevant equation of motion. Again, you get it from considering the free part of the Lagrangian. So the relevant equation of motion is the Dirac equation. Again, it'll look a little bit different than we've seen it in the past, just because of the convention changes. So remember to get the propagator, we write down the free equation of motion. We use the Klein-Gordon for the ABC theory because those fields are scalars. Then we write the equation of motion in momentum space. In momentum space, this guy is gamma mu, p mu, minus mc, and again, I'm going to do away with the factor h bar. That's a convention, but we're going to do it every time we construct a propagator, so it won't, it won't be something you have to keep track of. And now guess what? <laughs> what is what kind of object is this? Uh, mark. That's a scalar. This. Oh, that? That, that? Everything's fully contracted except for you still have matrices in spin space. Yes. So. But what do we have to construct? It's inverse. Yes. It's inverse. I know. <laughs> okay, because after all, the rule is you take the inverse of the thing in brackets. Right? So I'm going to give it to you and leave it as a homework problem to, to just demonstrate that this is the inverse. You don't have to derive it. But the inverse of this thing actually becomes I times, well, multiplying, so I times the inverse of what's in brackets is I times gamma mu p mu minus mc over p squared minus m squared c squared. Okay. Okay? So this is a factor that we will write down for any internal matter line for a virtual particle. I see two hands. So I'm a little confused because the MC is a scale. Or MC is like MC, which is a scale. Here? Yeah. 
Or is there like a hidden extra spin? There's room? always a hidden matrix. Okay, so there's like a identity. to make this consistent. Identity what is it? Identity. Yeah, it's the identity and spin space. I mean, that's it's present when you write down the Dirac equation, right? I mean, this this is a spin matrix. There has to be a spin matrix over here. It's the identity. So yeah, we just we're not going to write the identity everywhere. But yeah, okay. Lastly, to get the to get the propagator factor for an internal photon, okay, that's actually a little subtle. And I'll try and see if I can come up with a, a clean way to derive it um, and give it to you in class or give it to you in the notes. But I'm just going to write it down for now. So if we have an internal photon. The propagator for a photon becomes minus i times a factor of the metric. And actually, technically, this should be eta mu nu because we're in flat space, over p squared. Okay. At least some features of this should make sense. p squared in the denominator instead of p squared minus m squared c squared because, of course, the photon is massless. Okay, and the fact that we have a factor of the metric in here is just tied up with the idea that the photon is itself a vector field. So it's got more complicated transformation properties in space time. Again, I'm gonna find a cleaner way to derive a clean way to derive that presented in the notes. Yeah. So to start that one you would start with the Broca equation, right? With the so what? Broca massless Broca. Right. Yeah. But then you have these issues of gauge invariance, so you have to take a particular gauge condition, the Lorentz condition is usually the one we apply, and then you have to be uh, con converting that to momentum space and then forming the inverse. Okay, but these are tensor inverses and it's a little weird. And when we plug this into our, uh, as we're writing out our interactions and all that, is this also going to have an I for spin space or not? A what for spin space? I mean, identity for spin space? No, no, so the, the photon is not a spinner. So yes. the, the photon is not a spinner, so this is legitimately just uh, a tensor in space-time because it's got space-time indices, but it's a scalar in spin space. Okay. This object, of course, is what kind of object? It's a matrix. It's a matrix in spin space, so when we write it down, we've got to be careful of where to put it. Okay. All right, so these are our sort of three, well, four, I guess, if you will. Four key elements or building blocks of calculating Feynman diagrams in QED, all right? Okay, and again, there's, there's you know, derived or at least constructed at some length an analogy with what we do with the ABC theory. Okay, so with all of this in mind, And, and again, the, the reason I go and I do all this starting from the Lagrangian is if we have a, a prescription for how to get the diagrams and their evaluations from the Lagrangian, well, we have the Lagrangians for all the forces. It, maybe they're complicated, but we have them, so we can just apply the prescription and get these ever more complicated rules. All right, so without any further ado, here we go. Um, so, in evaluating these things, there's some very useful information that we're going to uh, eventually make use of. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you because when I start writing down these rules, some of the things I write down, you're like, what's that? I don't know what that is. So, I'm going to remind you of some useful things. And. I'm going to write down the corresponding expression for the three types of particles that we encounter. And everything I write could be for muons and anti-muons, or tau ions and anti-tau ions, and so forth and so on. I'm just going to use the electron and the positron as sort of my canonical example. So each of these has, if you will, a wave function, or it's actually just a, well, yeah, we call it a wave function. Um, so, for, if, the, if the particle is propagating in free space, then and these are expressions which we've actually derived in the other uh, sort of convention. So, for, a, for an electron, 
we have this sort of plane wave momentum factor, e to the minus i over h bar p dot x. And then this guy right here is a four component Dirac spinner. And we've seen those before and we've sort of derived what those would look like if the particle was at rest and then we looked at what they would look like if, if the particles were moving. What are the indexes on u there? Yeah. I'm going to tell you in just a second. Okay, so if you need, well, let me just let me just write down the corresponding expressions for the positron and the photon, and then we'll talk about uh, what the bits of these are. So, remember that antiparticles essentially we can think of as moving backwards in time, and that's the reason why we have the different sign and the exponential. Again, we're revisiting. Uh, topics that we talked about at length when we were looking at solutions to the Dirac equation. Uh, this time, the four component spinner we call VSP, and I'll give you an actual form of U and, F, U and V in just a second. And then for photons, we actually looked at this in a homework assignment, and the form of the photon wave function, again, we take plane waves. the polarization vector associated with the photon state, okay? P dot x is just the four momentum dotted with the four positions, so that's P mu x mu. I'm just going to write it as P dot x. S in all of these cases just takes one and two as values. Okay, you can think for the electron and the positron, S is associated with spin up and spin down two independent states of spin. For the photon, it's a vector, so we might initially think you would have three angular momentum states. It's spin one, so normally you'd get one, zero, and minus one. However, for photons, since they're massless, they have to be transversely polarized, which means you only get the L equals plus one and minus one spin states. So again, you only get two states. So we can just call them one and two. Now, um, in particular, so the epsilons we can usually just take, or the, these these polarization vectors for the uh, for the photons we could just take to be constant. So we can take like zero one zero zero if we like. But for the spinners, these are more complicated. Remember when we were constructing solutions to the Dirac equation for moving spinners, they actually the four component spinner had momentum in it. So because you're going to use these in your homework it's probably useful to give you what these expressions look like in the new conventions. So if I want to construct, say, the spin up version of the electron four component spinner, I'm going to have in all of these a normalization factor like that. And then these should look vaguely familiar, although slightly different, again, because of our change in convention. Right, where you might recall in the limit that the momentum is zero, all of these p's go to zero and this just becomes one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, so we're sort of taking as a sort of a basis of this, of these spin solutions, one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one as the stationary solutions. And then we're generalizing those to non-zero momenta. Actually, I'm not going to write these down. These are in the notes. It's going to take me too much time to write them down. But you're going to have an expression for the second u. And in that situation, what you're going to find is that these two are flipped. And essentially, these are flipped with a few sign changes. Okay, that's, again, something we saw when we looked at the solutions to the Dirac equation. And then when we go to the antiparticle spinners, of course, for the antiparticle spinners, what we expect, the same normalization. But this time, we're going to be working with all of our momentum dependence in the upper two entries, and then the lower two entries will just be 1, 0, and 0, 1, respectively. Okay? Again, you're going to need these for the homework. They're in the lecture notes, all four of them. Okay? 
So that's what our U's and our V's are corresponding to. And again, the epsilons are just going to correspond to uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, et cetera. And I'll show you how you're actually going to work with those in due time. All right. Yeah. Did I miss it? Is P just like knowing which part of the vector you're in then? P is just the momentum. It's, it's illustrating that this has momentum dependence. Okay. Uh, the oh, epsilon not, does not have momentum oh, dependence. Oh, it's not index P. It's a... Yeah, sorry. Th this is literally just reminding you that the okay. spinners have momentum dependence. And with, with what I just wrote, you see that that's the case. So uh, again, this is just a normalization factor. This is our typical plane wave momentum dependence this exponential. It's got a different sign for matter and antimatter. And then this is a four component Dirac spinner. There are two versions of it, a spin up and a spin down version that you indicate by choosing S to be one or two. And this is just reminding you that it has momentum in okay. this. So does Psi also have an S uh, index? Because it looks like you are you. Yeah, to you, you, yeah, you could you could think of size having an S index if you like, but I, I'm not going to worry about the label psi because I'm never actually going to write psi anywhere, so I'm not being too precarious okay. about the notation of psi. What I am going to be writing and using are these factors, so that's why I want to remind you they have momentum dependence and then they have a spin label. Are we summing over S? Huh? You mean sum over S? Yeah. We're going to get there. Okay. So yeah, we are. Okay, so a couple of more pieces of information that are going to be useful. Um, uh, the equations of motion and momentum space satisfied by each of these. So the spinner U, it doesn't matter what its spin is, it can be one or two, uh, satisfies the Dirac equation in momentum space, whereas the conjugate spinner, or sorry, the, the antiparticle spinner, satisfies the conjugate Dirac equation. This is something that you can derive because you have the functional form of u and v, and you know what gamma mu, p mu, and mc is. So you literally just construct this operator, act on this thing, and show that it's equal to zero. In fact, you at some level did this on homework. And then for the photon, we actually have equations of motion which look a bit funny. We have the transversality condition, and then we have that the time component of the polarization four vector is zero. So the first is the Lorentz gauge condition, and the second one is the Coulomb gauge condition. And don't get too tied up with this. It's, it's not something we're going to explicitly work with so much. Okay. Working with photons is weird because you've got these sort of, there's spin one, so you've got what are extra degrees of freedom, because you expect your polarization states, you've got to remove some of those because they're not physical, and so it's a bit more complicated of a story. Um, but, let's see, so we also have the adjoint spinners, I might say adjoint spinners, what? Well, remember in the Dirac equation, it was side bar side. In fact, for mass terms, it was side bar side. So the U's and the V's everywhere are for the size. And then we have to get corresponding expressions for the adjoints. So as we learned, we, we actually learned how to construct side bar, but the construction of side bar, or the construction of the adjoint of U is, in, is analogous to the construction of the adjoint of side bar. We just take the Hermitian adjoint of U, and then we multiply it on the right by gamma zero. Remember, earlier in our earlier conventions, we had a factor of I in there, but we no longer have that in the new conventions. And then to construct an adjoint for uh, epsilon mu, we allow for the fact that we can have a complex linear combination of polarization vectors. And so to construct a real quantity from that, we have to complex conjugate it. And then obviously, that guy would give us a real quantity in the end. Okay, so the adjoint for 
the polarization states of the photon are just built from complex conjugation and raising the index. Okay. So remember, at the end of the day, the idea of an adjoint is that that's a number. That's, that's kind of how we work towards what does the adjoint need to be. And that's actually how we found that we needed this gamma naught in there, surprisingly. Okay. Again, if you don't remember this, you can head back to the lecture notes or those wonderful YouTube videos of cats and stuff. All right, the adjoints themselves satisfy equations of motion, which will be important. to perhaps the two most important results that are going to be of immense use in QED. That is, when we do experiments, okay, we send particles in and particles come out. This could be one particle that's decaying. Okay, there's, there's many possibilities. Generally, when we do experiments, we do not control the spin of the particles coming in. We do not say we're going to send in electrons or we're going to collide electrons and positrons that are spin up along the z-axis. We just take a random collection of electrons, a random collection of positrons, smash them into each other, and we get what comes out. What that means is that we must average over incoming spins. Moreover, typically we do not care about the spin of what comes out. We will say this thing came out whether it's spin up or spin down. We don't care. So for the products coming out, we sum over spins. Remember, when we, when we calculate these things, we're summing over all final states for the particular process in hand. And if we're saying, I just want the answer no matter what the outgoing spin is, then I sum over it. Okay. To actually do this averaging and this summing, I mean, they're obviously going to both begin with a sum, and then this is going to just have a, a dividing factor in front of it. To, to do both of these processes, we are eventually going to make use of formulas for summing over spin states. So we first of all have an orthonormality oh yeah, condition, which says if I have an adjoint of one spin, and a spin, or if I have an adjoint spinner of one spin, S, and a spinner of a spin S prime, then they are perpendicular or orthogonal if they have different spins. So if one is one and the other is two, then they're orthogonal. They'll give you zero. They have to have the same spin, so one, one, or two, two in order to give you a non-zero result, and then there's just a normalization factor of 2mc. For the spinners describing the antimatter, we also have a normalization, but this time the overall factor, or an orthonormality condition, but this time the overall factor comes with a minus 2mc. This is not something you have to take my word for. You can take the US prime, form its conjugate, Remember, I gave you an expression for us. You can construct its conjugate, or its adjoint, sorry. You can multiply them together and find this result. This is something you can do. Do you want to do it? Will we do it? Well, maybe. I don't know. You want to do it? Yeah. 
Okay, good. It'll be an hour. Um, I asked, and someone, or somebody, very proudly said yes. I want to do it. Okay. And then we have, and then we have photon, uh, photon with normality condition. And then lastly, and this is perhaps the most important, is okay. We know when you get a non-zero product. What do you do when you actually sum? So what does a completeness relationship look like? And this is where it gets weird. If I sum over the spins of a spinner and its conjugate, or its adjoint, I notice the order is reversed here, then this gives me back the Dirac operator. Again, it looks weird, but it is something that you can derive because you have U, you know how to construct U bar, you can write them down with the same spin and then add up what you get when you do it with spin 1-1 one, one and spin 2-2. Two, two. And in the end, you can construct that Dirac operator again, mm -hmm. UP mu plus MC. And then, of course, it's probably no surprise that if you sum over the spins for the antiparticle spinners, you get back. Actually, this is the conjugate. This is, it's funny, this is the conjugate Dirac operator and this is the Dirac operator. Okay. But that's the result that comes out. And then for the photons, if we sum over spins and I'm only summing here over the spatial components of these because the time-like components are zero. If I tried to include the time-like component in the sum, I'd have a hard time writing the right-hand side. So we just look at the, norm at the completeness relation in terms of the sum over the spatial components of the polarization vectors. This is not something we're going to make so much use of. These expressions we're going to make a ton of use of. So all of these things are going to eventually become useful, but so far I still haven't told you how to write down M. How do you write down M in QED? So in four minutes, I'm going to do that. I know. So in four minutes, I'm going to show you how to write down M, and then when we come back on Thursday, we're actually going to start calculating M, and what we're going to find is that even evaluating M is going to be much, much more complicated than what we found in the ABC theory. So for now, what you should have in mind... So for now, what you should have in mind... I don't even know what I was about to say. So we draw the diagram for the process involved, and we know how to draw the diagram at this point. And when we draw a diagram, remember that we label all particles We label all particle lines, and we might even have photons coming in and out. We label all particle lines in our diagram with arrows indicating the flow. Photons do not need arrows. They do not have a charge. They are their own antiparticle. There's no need to distinguish a photon flowing, a photon flow in one direction from a photon flow in another direction. For each of these, we label momenta. And again, for external particles, the momentum must always go forward or backwards in time. Label external momenta with P. And then anytime you have internal lines, so these are the external cases, if you have internal lines, <coughs> OK? 
Okay, again, they're going to be positron, electron, or electron, positron, or photon lines. Then you label their momenta with a Q. And the Qs you can actually do forward or backwards in time, it doesn't matter. Okay, because at the end of the day, remember, we're going to integrate over these Qs and we're going to enforce total momentum conservation. You have to give the external lines forward momentum in time. Internal lines, it doesn't matter. You can pick it either way. Okay. Now, once you've got the picture drawn, then we start writing things down. So each external line gets a factor. Now this is something which we did not do in the ABC theory. Because in the ABC theory, the only quantity that was relevant for the particles coming in and going out was their momentum. There was nothing else to specify. But their momentum actually ended up being a part of the golden rule. Here though, these particles have spin states. And so when we have particles coming in, we have to say this is the spin state that it's in. We're going to average over those in the, at the end of the calculation, and we're going to sum over what's coming out. But we have to have a way of distinguishing like one spin state from another in terms of uh, what we have before we average. So here we go. If I have a particle coming into the diagram, I write down a factor of u is exactly that u. If I have an antiparticle coming into the diagram, I get a factor of v bar. Okay, This is an antiparticle coming into the diagram because the arrow indicating the flow is to the left. If I have a photon coming into the diagram, then I write down a factor of epsilon sub mu for the polarization of the photon state coming in. And then for the particles going out, I basically write down the adjoints of all of those. And actually, sorry, I don't write down an adjoint there technically. I just write down the complex conjugate. Now, for each of these factors, when you write them down, and, and, and don't get me wrong, you could have a diagram with maybe two electrons coming in, and then a photon. <laughs> no, you can't have that diagram. <laughs> uh, what is it I'm wanting to do? Oh, I'm wanting to get not ready to do this. I didn't even have to do a box. It doesn't matter. I have to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do an eighth order diagram as a simple example. Uh, in this case, I have two electrons coming in. So both of these would get a factor of u, but I need to remember that they're different particles. Well, that's where we make use of these momentum labels. And so we would call this u1 and u2, just to remind ourselves this is the u associated with the momentum of p1, because this is going to have momentum dependence, and this is the u associated with p2, and it will have momentum dependence. So generally, each of these is going to be labeled also by the particle's momentum index. Okay. Is that uh, epsilon mu, should that mu not be raised? Why? Yeah, here it's not raised. Don't worry about it for now. OK. Um, Okay, yeah, I, I, we're going to have to pause there because I don't even think I can finish writing down the rules. Um, okay, so yeah, so I'm going to um, I'm going to stop there. We'll finish writing down the rules next time, and I think it's actually better to write down the rules and just go straight into an example anyway. So. Uh, that's hilarious. Um, Robin is armed. Yeah. Uh, he has no chance. I want to see um, so, I want to see failure. So we're gonna um, we're gonna we're gonna finish writing the rules and we're gonna jump straight into an example of using them. I am gonna post a new homework assignment tonight, and if you have time before Thursday, 
I want you to go ahead and start working on at least the first couple of problems because it's going to have you reminding yourself a little bit about the gamma matrices, a little bit about using these spinners, and it's just going to have you in a better place when you come in Thursday to appreciate what we're doing. Now you want to work the whole assignment, but at least the first couple of problems that you have some time. Say it again? It's probably going to be due next Tuesday. The 26th. Yeah, the day you guys aren't going to be here. And we'll arrange for a makeup.